Appreciate that. If you get your Bible, turn over to Mark chapter 3. And um, we're going to continue right there, the next verse uh, this evening. And uh, we'll just continue there. And what's what's on my heart this evening, uh, I, I think it just deals with what we what we kind of carry on from over in this morning on, on how's your heart. And uh, we kind of go right into another story. And this is kind of a, it's a special passage because... Uh, the ministry of Jesus here is in is in full swing. I mean, things are things are going well, and uh, the common people of that area they're following Jesus because he preaches the word of God in power, and he's he's healing people, and he's he's uh, um, just doing all kinds of things, and he's working miracles for the glory of God. And the religious leaders could not stand it. Somebody uh, came out this morning, and and they said, preacher, what's overwhelming about that whole that whole story uh, this morning was that people could literally see the miracle that Jesus performed, changing that withered hand, making it whole again, and they still harden their heart. How, how hard can a heart be to see Jesus literally, not just reading it, literally perform a, a miracle, and still you don't believe it? And now, on, on, on that side, many of those people thought that Jesus was the son of Beelzebub. They thought He was doing it in the name of the devil. And uh, so... Uh, they just could not see past all of that, and they could not believe. And so here we are, we find these verses that Jesus, notice verse 13, And he goeth up into a mountain, and calleth unto him whom he would, and they came unto him. And he ordained twelve that they should be with him, that he might send them forth to preach. We find that he goes up into a mountain. Uh, I said this passage was special because it reminds us that anyone who will follow the Lord can be used by the Lord. I want you to notice the first thing we come to. Let's let's pray first. Heavenly Father, again, we thank you for the opportunity to preach. I pray that you will bless everything that is said and done this evening, Lord, as we just go to the next verse and uh, we just start looking at what you did. And uh, Lord, thank you for changing lives. Thank you that the Word of God has power. In Jesus' name, amen. Look at the Master. Verse 13, here's what he does. And he goeth up into a mountain and calleth unto him who he would, and they came unto him. Now, notice that after, I maybe got a little ahead of myself, but notice after he healed that, that man with the withered hand, uh, he healed many more in verse 10. Insomuch that they pressed upon him for the, to touch him as many as had plagues. And unclean spirits, when they saw him, fell down before him and cried, saying, Thou art the Son of God. And he straightly charged them that they should not make him known. Now, it's what he said. He said, hey, you know what? Uh, glorify God about it, but don't go around town bragging on me as far as uh, uh, trying to make me some popular superstar. I want you to go and, uh, go, 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 and go back to your families. Go back home and uh, in, enjoy being plague free. And, and tell your family, but, but let's not spread it abroad. I, well, then right after that, he goes to verse 13. And he goeth up into a mountain, and he calleth unto him and said, at whom he would, and they came unto him. I believe this is a... Uh, it focuses on the Lord Jesus Christ as he steps aside from the public work for a little while into a time of what we would call solitude. Because it's a special communion, a time of special communion. Notice what Mark says. Look at that phrase in verse 13 again. He goeth up into a mountain. Now, Luke is a little bit more specific. Turn over to Luke chapter, uh, Matthew, Mark, Luke chapter 6. And I want you to see what Luke has to say about this same story. And uh, Luke chapter 6, and look at, uh, in, verse number, uh, in verse number 11. Here's what it says in Luke six eleven, And they were filled with madness and communed one with another what they might do to Jesus. Now, we, we covered that in Mark chapter 3. Well, here's what, what, what he does in, in verse 11. And they were, um, in, or verse 12 rather. But we'll go with verse 11. And they were filled with madness and communed one with another uh, what they might do to Jesus. Verse 12. And it came to pass in those days that he went out into a mountain to pray. So here in, in the, the sister verse in Mark chapter 3 is the, the same as Luke chapter 6 we see that Jesus goes up into a mountain, but He doesn't go up into a mountain to just rest. He goes up into a mountain to pray. Because it says in verse uh, 12, that He went up into a mountain to pray and continued all night uh, in prayer to God. 
So he's up in the mountain. By the way, we saw that mountain, Brother Peter, the, the mountain that uh, right outside of Capernaum. Big tall mountain. Jesus would go up into those high places and he would go and he would take some inner disciples and he would go up there and he would pray often. Well, here he goes up into this mountain and he prays and he continued there all night in prayer. So Jesus has just, or he's about to ordain these 12 men who will be his spokesman, if you will, the representatives of his ministry. And he, he's about to take these, these 12 people and, and he's about to make a big decision. And so what's he do uh, when he's about to make this big decision? He goes up into a mountain and he prays. And I believe that's a lesson for us tonight. The lesson is, before we make some big decisions, we need to really pray. I believe it's a good lesson that if we just stopped here tonight and just thought about it for a second. You know, Jesus is resting. We understand that. He just came from a pretty dramatic situation there in Capernaum. And He goes up into a mountain to pray. And He knows that He's going to need those 12 men. We'll say a little bit more about that. But He's going to call these 12 men. And He goes up and He communes with God a little while. And you know, I, it, it just struck me the other day that uh, Jesus, God the Son, God in the flesh needed to commune with God the Father before He made a big decision. And Jesus took time out of His busy schedule to spend a, a protracted amount of time in prayer. And, and here's my thing for you, just on this point right here. If Jesus took time to pray to the Father over this, and you say, well, Jesus, you know, He could do whatever He wants, but hold on a second, He's showing us an example. Man, I'm talking about a big decision. How many of you... I mean, we, how many big decisions do we encounter a week? Man, I've had two or three really major decisions this week. I know me personally, and that's not that's a way that, that, that's the dad side, that's the husband side. I'm not talking about a pastor. I have those daily, but I'm talking about big decisions as a dad, a husband, which is, by the way, it's a high calling. It's a it's a it's a great responsibility. I love my family and I love my wife, and what a great responsibility. Hey, here it is, Dad. Aside from the pastoring, aside from leading a church, aside from all the things that you deal with with other families, uh, if I've got a, a major important, uh, uh, some type of dilemma or some type of thing that I've got to do, uh, I want to spend time with God in that matter. Whether it be financial, whether it be spiritual, whether it be uh, some type of physical thing, uh, whether it be a test, whether it be... And if you've not spent time with God, whether you're 85 or 15... We, we all need that communion with God. You know, what you, you know what Jesus is doing? Jesus is showing us right here in Mark chapter 3 the importance of us breaking away and spending time with God. I was at that church this week in Bryson City and there was a man that allowed me to use a cabin. And when I say a cabin, this thing was ultra nice. It was made of all reclaimed wood. He was a retired man, taught in the school system for 30 some years and uh, he's got three or four cabins in Bryson City and around. And he said, Pastor, we always put our guest speakers in this one cabin. And man, it's nice. Everything was rustic and all. He said, I actually sell lumber to Nick Saban. I said, well, I'm not staying there. And uh, not going to stay there. If you don't know who Nick Saban is, he's the coach at Alabama. And uh, so anyway, he said, no, but, but he said, I, I do. I go and tear down old barns and, and all over the country. My business does. And we go build these. And they're beautiful. I mean, it's it, he, he's just such a precious man. But here's what he said. He said, Pastor, if you ever need to get away, I know we're only a couple hours away, but he said, if you ever need this cabin, I'll, I'll, I'll rent it to you for nothing if you need to just come up here, rest, and pray. What a blessing. You know what I said, Sir, I, I may take you up on that for a few days this year. Just where we can come, rest, and pray. You say, why? There's something when we turn the cell phone off there's something when we turn the television off and the noise, the computer, and we turn everything down in our life and we turn God up. And the only way that we can do that is, is when we go up into a high place and we pray. I realize that we're not going to go up into a mountain today. I realize that that's not what I'm talking about. Don't miss this picture. It's when we get along with God. It's when we go to a place and we get along with God in the matter of prayer. Church is not always enough. Now, I thank God that you're here this evening, and I really do. I thank God that you're here. But can I tell you, church, 
there's going to be a, a point in your life where you're going to need more than just church. You're going to have to come to a place where you have to read the Word of God and you're going to have to commune with God back and forth. You're going to have to pray. Church, you might can run off of church for a little bit. You might can say, man, yesterday we had a great day at church. Folks say, and that'll last for a few days. I hope it lasts for a long time, but it, it'll last for a few days. But by next Sunday, you're running on fumes. I tell you, I would love to pastor a group of people that know God. And not just for salvation, but know Him in a personal way, an intimate way. Hey, are you praying? You know what prayer will do? God has promised to hear our prayers. God has promised that. In Jeremiah 33, 3, it says, Call unto me and I will answer thee, and show thee great and mighty things which thou knowest not. Many of you can quote that verse, but you're not taking God up to it. You're not, listen, prayer is a, a wonderful tool. Isaiah 65, verse number 24. And it shall come to pass that before they call, I will answer. And while they are yet speaking, I will hear. God has promised to hear our prayers. He doesn't just hear your prayers uh, because He likes, the, likes your voice or likes your family or likes where you came from or likes the church you attend. He hears your prayer because you're, you're, you're a child of God. I thank the Lord for that. So not only does He promise to hear our prayers, but God has promised to answer our prayers. Now, now let, may I remind you, God's answers are yes, no, and wait a while. Not now. But He answers. Sometimes we just like the yes part. And sometimes we even like the no part depending on what we prayed, but we don't like that wait a while. Can I tell you though, God hears and answers prayer. Uh, you say, preacher, where's that found? Matthew chapter 7, verse 7 and 8. Ask and it shall be given you. Seek and you shall find. Knock and it shall be opened unto you. For every one that asketh, receiveth. And he that seeketh, findeth. And to him that knocketh, it shall be opened. John sixteen twenty three. And in that day ye shall ask me nothing. Verily, verily, I say unto you, whatsoever ye shall ask in the Father in my name, he shall give it you. He has promised to answer your prayers. Church, can I ask you this question tonight? When's the last time you had an answer to prayer? The reason we don't have answers to prayers, we're not asking. And we're not praying. I'm telling you right now, church, as simple as, as prayer, we've made it some spooky thing, but as simple as prayer is, we ought to be doing more of it. What we have tried to do is we have tried to make prayer some spooky, ultra-religious something and we just feel like, ah, I've got to get down there and I've got to do this and say this certain thing. But you realize it's, it's literally just talking to your father. As a friend talketh to his father. I'm talking about prayer is something where it ought to be where I'm talking, like I would talk to you before or after the service. It ought to be that natural for us to stop and talk to our father that way. Pray without ceasing. Lord, I just, you know, it's been a, a couple minutes or I've just got this little spare time here. Lord, I just thought I'd talk to you. Lord, I just have this thing, and boy, so-and-so just asked me to pray for them. Hey, somebody came out the door this afternoon and asked me to pray for a co-worker who, uh, who is uh, atheist and God's dealing with them. I think God's working a little bit. And used a couple situations at that job to work. You know what I did this afternoon? I just stopped and I didn't pray this big, long, drawn-out I just said, Lord, somebody asked me to pray for this man, and you're dealing with him. And Lord, I, I pray that you would save that man. Don't Listen. Here's, here's the way I look at it. This may sound harsh, but God knows my heart is not. If you're not praying for it, don't ask me to. And if it's not important to you, why should you think it's important to God? If it's not important for you to pray, then why do you expect God to feel like it's important? Well, He ought to think it. No, no hold on a second. If it's real important, shouldn't you be on your knees praying? I want God to restore my marriage. Have you prayed about it? I want God to bring back my kid. Do you, have you prayed about it? I want God to give me a job. Have you prayed about it? I want God to do this. Have you prayed about it? Hey, can I, can I say, don't ask everybody else to pray for a situation and you yourself have not prayed. That, the, please don't let that come across condescending because God knows my heart. I enjoy when, and, and love it when someone confides in me and says, Preacher, will you pray? And I, I'm not always going to ask you that, but you know, if I put you on the spot and say, Man, how much, how much time have you prayed about this? You're asking someone to take time out of their day to pray for you and you're not... That's awful selfish. Prayer 
is the key thing. It's the ultimate thing. It's the way that you... Do you realize that when Jesus died on the cross, the veil was rent? That when He died and when He uh, rose again, that actually gave us that we could enter into the presence and we could come into the holy place. We no longer had a priest. Do you realize that we don't no longer have to rely on a priest to go in and atone for our sins and pray and put blood on the altar? And Do we, you realize that we can just uh, go to the throne room ourselves and we can go into the presence of God and stay as long as we want and go in when we want? And you wouldn't take, you wouldn't take that time to do that? Pray. How, how, listen, if our Lord Jesus puts so much emphasis in verse number 13, when He goes up into a mountain and gets away from all the hustle and bustle, you know, I can't pray in big crowds. Sometimes uh, when, 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 when we're in a group and maybe preachers or whatever, the other night the preacher invited me into a prayer room and uh, man, it was loud in there. All these guys are praying. I really struggle. Because, man, it's like, right, you know, it's just, oh, God, I'd rather, you know, and everybody's, and boy, they're praying. Listen, I really believe those guys are praying. But sometimes I'm, it's just my, my nature, I'll start listening to what they're praying about. And then I forget where I'm at. Y'all know what I'm talking about? Y'all say, preacher, you do, I absolutely do that. And I'm like, Lord, I'm sorry. I'm, I'm over here listening to what he's praying about. And then I'll pray a little bit, and then I'll stop, and I'll say, Lord, this is pathetic, you know, but I'm still praying. But you know what, though, my, my sweet time with the Lord is just me and him. I can't pray with the television on. I can't pray with the cell phone on. I can't pray with, you know, people all around. I like praying when it's just me and God. And I believe that's how God just, and He wants that sweet time. The Lord went up in that mountain. He didn't take that whole crowd with Him. You know what He did? He escaped up there. He said, I, I need to get along with my Father. I need to pray. That's a good example for us. Is not the only time we pray is when a big group. If that's the only time you pray, sometimes I wonder about how your motives is. We ought to pray in, in private before we go out in public and pray. Amen? I believe that's scriptural. So God knows He's promised to answer our prayer. Hey, God uses prayers to accomplish His will in the world. He uses that. Uh, James chapter 5, verses 16 and 18. Listen to these verses. I love these verses. Confess your faults one to another and pray for one another that ye may be healed. The effectual fervent prayer of a righteous man availeth much. I love that. Don't y'all love that verse? That's one of my favorite verses in the New Testament. I love that. Elias was a man subject to like passions as we are, and he prayed earnestly that it might rain, not rain, and it rained not on the earth by the space of three years and six months. And he prayed again, and the heaven gave rain, and the earth brought forth her fruit. You know what he did? He prayed, and God answered that prayer, and he did it according to his will. The, listen, I love the verse going back to verse number 16. The effectual, fervent prayer of a righteous man availeth much. You know what it does? It changes the heart of God. We ought to pray, Thy will be done. Not my will, but Thy will be done. Lord, You, you, you control this situation. God, You according to Your will, Lord, You, you do this. And, and you know what? I, you say, Preacher, you mean our prayer can turn, to, turn the heart of God? Absolutely. Think about Abraham. Abraham changed the heart of God. God was going to destroy Sodom and Gomorrah. What did, what did Abraham do? He stood between Sodom and Gomorrah and he actually went between them and changed the heart of God for a while. He held back the wrath of God. One man, not, not a group of men, one man stood between a wicked city and the judgment of God. Would to God we have some more people stand in the gap. Stand in the gap of prayer. You know why God has been blessing this church so much? Because of prayer warriors. Because people have been praying. People have been seeking God. I really truly believe that. So God uh, uses prayer to accomplish His will in the world. God knows what you are going to ask Him before you ask it. Is that not crazy? God knows. You say, well, well, since that's true, some people have wondered why you need to pray. After all, God is only going to do what He pleases to do. But your prayers may change. Listen, your prayers and mine change nothing, so why pray? Hold on a second. Have you ever thought that the whole end of prayer might be prayer itself? Have you ever considered that truth that God commands us to pray because He longs for fellowship and communion with people like us? He desires for us to pray so that we might spend time in His presence and time spent in His presence is well spent. 
Sometimes I really just believe that God enjoys our fellowship. Isn't that a blessing? So let me encourage you this evening, while I, I stay just on that one verse there for a minute, let me just encourage you to be a man or woman of prayer. Let me just encourage you uh, that, uh, that you ought to pray, no matter how old you are, no matter how young you are, you ought to pray. And, and you know what you say, Pastor, what should we pray for? Hey, listen, uh, we ought to be praying, you know, not just for our church, we ought to be praying for our nation. Pray, boy, we need, we need God to do something. We need to be praying for our city. We need to be praying for our families. We need to be praying for our church. And, and then, Lord, that you continue your blessings on this church. Keep saving souls. Lord, don't take your hand off of this church. Hey, I could give you a whole list of... How about the missionaries that we support? How many, how, how many missionaries that's on the field today and they didn't... Listen, they're in hard places. They're in tough places. And they haven't seen what we got to see today. You know what? We need to pray for them. Not just support them financially. Pray. So it was a, a time of special communion. It was also a time of sovereign choice. Look at what, look what happens here. So, uh, verse 14... Or verse 13, rather, and he goeth up into a mountain, and he calleth unto him whom he would. He called unto him whom he would, and they came unto him. Now, uh, he had already called them to follow him. We saw that Peter, Andrew, and James, John, Matthew, now he calls them to a special place of service. Well, we talked about that last week, didn't he? Uh, didn't last Sunday night we, we preached out of Mark chapter 2 when Jesus came by the receipt of custom? And Levi was there and he walked a call to salvation. Levi, by the way, his name's changed. God saw something in Levi. It was the grace of God. Same thing he saw in you. So you, you, Levi's saved. But now he calls them to a special place. He calls them for service. The Bible says he called unto him whom he would. And because he wanted... you, said, Somebody might ask, Preacher, why did God just choose those twelve disciples, those inner twelve, what we would, what we would call... I, you know what my simple answer is? Because he wanted to. There was nothing special about these twelve men. Do you realize there was nothing special about them? Jesus called them because he wanted to. He just did it. He didn't call the mayor in town. He didn't call the best speaker in town. He didn't call the guy over here that everybody liked. He didn't go by and say, Now, how many, how many friends do you have on Facebook? Oh, yeah, that's, well, that's more than him. And uh, well, I'm going to pick you because, man, you're better looking. And you, you know. No, that's how we do things. Oh, you're a better singer than him, so yeah, you do that. Oh, you're a better preacher, so we'll have you for revival. Jesus, he's no respecter of person. So you know what he did? He found some gruff, rough rough, lost, got him saved, and guess what? We see discipleship. He, he, he saves their soul, and then he says, you know what I need you to do? I need you to follow. I need you to follow because he, he wanted to. It was his sovereign choice that made him based on his own will. He, he wanted to. You know how he did you? Hey, listen, you're sitting here tonight. Guess what? If you're saved tonight, God saved you. But guess what? That's not the end. That's only the beginning. God wants you now after salvation to start following Him. It's a call to service. Hey, and then guess what? God called me to serve Him according to Scripture, but then God called me to preach. Hey, that's another call. Hey, can I just tell you tonight that God is calling, and by the way, He's still calling, so He called. Then we see the mission. Look at verse 14 and 15. The Bible says, And He ordained twelve, that they should be with Him, and that He might send them forth to preach. And to have power to heal sickness and to cast out uh, devils. Now we see this involved discipleship because he said in verse uh, verse thirteen, and they came unto him uh, that they should be with him. Notice that verse uh, in verse fourteen, and he can ordain the twelve that they should be with him. It was involved discipleship. You say, preacher, what do you get out of that? Well, that phrase highlights every disciple's first priority. Church, look at me. The first priority. Here it is, that they should be with Him. The first priority is being with Jesus. I know that's very simple, but that's, that's where it's at. That they should be with Him. It's spending time with God, being with Jesus, following in His footsteps, going after, follow, you see that? Follow me. That's what He wants. He wants people to follow Him, do as Christ did. Live as Christ lived. 
Touch people like Christ touched people. Preach like I preach. Be with me. Hey, you cannot be with Christ unless you're with Him. You can't be like Christ unless you're with Him. You can't live like Christ unless you're with Him. Wouldn't it be wonderful if Jesus would have picked you in those days to be a disciple? Think about that. The call. Jesus said, hey, uh, uh, you come with me. An old fisherman over here. You come with me. An old publican over here. I want you. We're going to change the world. I want you to be with me. I want you to come with me. Uh, that they should be with Him. Listen, there is nothing as important in your life than life spent with Jesus. Nothing. Nothing. Hey, spend time with Jesus. Spend time in His Word. We are as close to Him as we want to be. You say, where do you get that? James chapter 4 and verse number 8. Draw nigh to God, and He will draw nigh to you. Cleanse your hands, ye sinners, and purify your hearts, ye double-minded. Draw nigh to God, and guess what? He'll come to you. Preach, I want to get close to God. Snuggle up. I've got a 67 Chevrolet truck we're working on. Trying to get it running, get it restored. One day you're going to see it and you'll say, man, that's the junkiest thing. I think it's bad. Bad to the bone. It's got a bench seat in it. I, my first truck was a 1970 Chevrolet truck. It was a, 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 had a 350. Man, it was nice. Uh, sold it because uh, these little things called children started coming. And I uh, had to get rid of it. Needed a little money at that time. I regret it. I could have hung on to it. Probably should have. Good truck. It had a bench seat in it too. And my wife will remember on Monday nights was our date night. Monday nights. Uh, back in, And we used to go and with some other couples sometimes. And we'd go out to Salisbury. And we'd have a, a nice meal sometimes. And we played what they call volleyball. I mean, you know what volleyball is. We'd go to a racquetball court. And uh, Jacob, you remember those days some? We played a little bit. We'd invite people. Man, it was the funnest. Uh, we, we, it, you'd play with a big ball. And it's a racquetball court. It has a high net. And we would get about uh, eight people in there, teams. And we would play for a couple hours and go out to eat. We loved volleyball. And I'd take that old truck and me and her just get in. Somebody would come watch the kids. And, uh, and she'd snuggle up over there. I'd say, honey, it's a bench seat. You, can, you, you have my permission to get over close. And, and I'd drive down the road. Like the old timers did, and, and, and they'd have, you know what I mean, had that back little glass in the back. And uh, we enjoyed that time. And uh, I'll never forget that one time that um, we were in that truck. It was loud. Oh, I had them straight pipes on it. It was bad. And I remember I pulled up beside a police officer in town. It was at night. And I happened to look over him and I revved my engine, you know, just a little bit. And he looked over at me, and, uh, and Rebecca's like, honey, and she's hitting me. She's like, that's a police, you know, unmarked car. And uh, hit my hit my leg, and so I just did a little bit louder. And he gave me the thumbs up, <laughs> you know. And uh, it was great. And uh, but hey, we well, she would she would uh, get over there with me, and we just had those times. We had a good time. You know, I heard the story. It kind of reminded me uh, of a story of the uh, old, uh, you know, uh, back in the day they had the old bench seats in them old trucks, and and uh, husband and wife were married for a while, been married for years, and and they were driving down the road, and and uh, boy, they used to just snuggle up like that, and get real close they'd go out and just drive down them old dirt roads and they'd get real close and and then uh, as time went on they started drifting a little bit and one day the woman said uh, honey you remember the times that we used to go down the road and we used to drive and i'd I, we'd be sitting real close and you'd put your arm around me and we just had those good old days and he looked at her and said well i ain't went anywhere and you know you think about that the only person that had drifted had been her. He had to drive the car. And for whatever reason, listen, for whatever reason, she had drifted. Because, you know, the woman, it's always the woman's fault. <laughs> Y'all understand that, right? And uh, she had gotten mad at him over time, and he had just run her away. And uh, that went over like screen doors on a submarine right there. The ladies are mad, and the men are saying, Glory. Do you understand? Listen, the truth be told is he, he was absolutely right. Guess what had happened? Over time, their love for each other, I think sometimes we take for granted. The times that we spend together. Now listen, I'm not going to be real sentimental here as far as in this, me this is not the thrust of the message, but I doubt I'll get to it. I don't want to get too, uh, but there's a bunch of people sitting here today that wish they had that. They wish they had their mate to snuggle to and drive down the road and put their arm around them one more time. Hold on a second. Listen. 
while we while we have a listen while we can let's let's we have the relationship with Jesus Christ let's you know let's get close to him as much as we possibly can let's let's use that take that advantage and and uh, snuggle up close to him and draw nigh to God and he will draw nigh to you there's nothing as important in your life as time spent with Jesus Christ no point so we see involved discipleship the second thing i want you to see before we before we about close is this involved declaration notice what jesus tells these men to do uh, these disciples uh, he he says there in verse number 14 and he ordained 12 that they should be with him and that he might send them forth to what to preach he might send them forth to preach the the word preach is the act as a herald or to sound forth the message of the king that was what jesus wanted to do he wanted to actually send them forth to preach the good news of jesus christ he wanted them to preach that god has sent his son into the world to be their savior and to be their their lord and savior and to save the sinners it was a message of hope a message of peace a message of blessing and the disciples were to take this message to the people and call them to come to Jesus. What a great and high calling it is when you're called to preach the gospel. Listen, I, I don't know how many men in here we're gonna we're gonna uh, you know at some point try to preach everybody on or, or a couple Sunday nights. I'm burdened about that. I'd like to give our men opportunities to preach on Sunday evening and and help. And train them, and, and few of our men are in a in a local Bible college, and that's a blessing. And men, I, I really do challenge you to get that iron sharpened, if you will, and get that sword sharpened. Go to a place and get trained. But can I tell you this? What a great calling it is to preach the gospel. Please don't ever. And by the way, all of us have been called to preach to the lost. But I'm talking about to preach the the word of God. He said unto them, look at verse number fourteen again, and that they might send forth. To preach. We all know that everyone is called to be a preacher, but in fact, some of the people who claim to be preachers have never been called of God in the first place. We know that. Some have called themselves. Some, their mama called them. Some, their grandma called them or whatever. But others have been called by the church. But you can tell when God calls a man. Listen, usually when someone comes to me and says, Preacher, I think God's dealing with me about preaching, I'll say, well, let's try to forget about it. You say, that's crazy. No, because what I'm doing is, if God really called them, they can't forget about it. They'll come back. Joel, you'll know. A few weeks ago, Joel, uh, it was a few months ago, Joel, uh, uh, I think it was a text or something, and, or a call, or one night he wanted to talk. I can't remember, Joel. But it was, uh, he, he kind of laid it on me. Lord, uh, the Lord's calling me to preach. And I said, well, Joel, let's, you know, that's good and all. Uh, let's, we'll talk about it some other time exactly my response we'll talk about it some other time now some people would say preacher you ought to stop right there and just lay hands on the man and anoint him what you know, i mean that, that's unbelievable that a man hold on there's a bunch of people that's felt like they've been called but they never called i want to make sure that that's a calling from god and not an emotional decision because let me say if it's an emotional decision and he says he's called but never been called and he gets in this thing and starts preaching he'll realize real quick Mama's call ain't going to last. Daddy's call is not going to last. Only God's call will last. Only hey, You'll know it when it happens. I'm telling you, you can't get away from it. And Jesus called these men to preach. Then there's an involved demonstration. Notice the preaching ministry of these men. was to a, uh, It was accompanied by miracles. Notice what, what He does in verse number, uh, verse number 15. And to have power to heal sickness and to cast out devils. So they're preaching, but they have power to heal and to cast out devils. Now guess what? Guess who's in this bunch? Judas. Judas was called of God to preach. He had power to cast out devils, even though he was possessed by one. Explain that. He had power to heal. You know what that proves to us? It proves to us that you can have the, uh, you can have the performance but deny the power. There's a lot of people that know the right lingo. They know all the right things. They carry a Bible. They can dress it up on the outside. They do not know Christ on the inside. Judas is a prime example. If Jesus had 12 inner disciples and one of them was a devil, wonder what the church has. 
You ever thought about that? Oh, we had 400 today in church. How many were devils? Jesus had 12 and one of them was. The statistics are not in our favor. Seriously. Hey, and by the way, Jesus knew. The, but you say, well, the bound, them other disciples had to know. How, I don't see that. They didn't know. He put a pretty good show on, didn't he? Let me tell you, uh, church, that the power of God is real. And the preaching ministry of these men were accompanied by signs and gifts. They were given this power to validate their ministry to the people that they preached to. And, and we do not need this sign anymore. We don't need this sign. You say, why? Because uh, the sign gifts were designed to speak to the Jewish people. That's exactly what we find in 1 Corinthians chapter 14, verse 22. Wherefore tongues are for a sign, not to them that believe, but to them that believe not. For the prophesying serveth not for them that believe not, but for them which believe. So, uh, today our message is validated by Jesus Christ changes lives by grace through faith. We no longer need the signs. We no longer need the uh, raising uh, this uh, power and, and healing people and raising people from the dead and, and all that stuff. Friend, can I tell you, the power in the message you heard this morning is that the grace of God changes lives. You can see it today. That's our message today. So these men had the power. But notice this in verse 16, and I'm done. I, I'm not going to get all this, but I want you to notice some of their names. Look at verse 16. And Simon, he surnamed Peter. You notice how Jesus changed everybody's name. He never kept their... I don't know if Jesus is like, I don't like your name, I'm changing it. I'm changing it. I mean, you think about it. Everybody in Jesus' encounter, he just about changes their name. Simon, uh, who's surnamed Peter, and James, the son of Zebedee, and John, the brother of James, and he surnamed uh, Bionergies, which is the sons of thunder, and Andrew, and Philip, and uh, Bartholomew, and Matthew, and Thomas, and James, the son of Alphaeus, and Thaddeus, and Simon, uh, the Canaanite, and Judas Iscariot, which also betrayed him, and they went into an house. So we see their names Simon, the Hebrew name, is a rock or a stone. And Jesus changed His name to, to Peter. This Greek name is also means a rock or stone. And Peter was the leader of the group. He was the fisherman. He had a, very, uh, he had a family and he was very outspoken and very opinionated. He failed the Lord in a very public manner. But Peter also humbled himself and was restored. And he was used of the Lord in a mighty, mighty way. Peter, a great man. Think about James. James was also a fisherman. And he was a member of the Lord's inner circle. James and John were singled out. And Peter were singled out for special times of the ministry when uh, the daughter of Jairus was raised from the dead. And when Jesus was transfigured. And when Jesus went a little further into Gethsemane to pray. James was a great leader in the early church. He was finally beheaded uh, there by Herod. But you know, think about these things. Peter, James, John. John, he was the brother of James, who also was a member of that inner circle. And John was known as the beloved disciple. John was the one that laid his head on Jesus' bosom, heard the heartbeat of the Lord. You think about it. There was a man, I believe his name was Bill Wall. Bill was a man who had a son. His son was very sick. He was a good boy, very good boy. And there was another man who, uh, he was a stunt a stunt, uh, stuntman for, uh, for Hollywood. He, he did all these crazy things, lived a rough life, lived, lived a terrible life. And uh, his son, uh, one day, Bill Wall's son, was tragically killed in an automobile accident. And he died. And, and this, uh, this man uh, that had been living a really rough life, a stuntman, he went to the doctor one day and, and the doctor said, Sir, your, your organs are shutting down and... And uh, your heart, you need a heart desperately, and we're going to try to help you, but unless you get a heart transplant, you're not going to live. So this man was put on a heart transplant uh, list, and, and finally waiting and waiting and waiting, he finally got the call when this young man died. Didn't know each other. Lived on another part of the, the nation. And so they flew this man, flew that heart out there to the doctor, rather, uh, that hospital, and they, they implanted that heart in this man, and it took. And this man got the heart of this young man. And so after six months, the law is you can't find out for six months that you, whose heart it was. It's, it's against the law. I think it's still that way today. And just in case it doesn't take and all that. And so uh, for six months he waited and he finally said, you know what, after six months I'd like to find out whose heart I have in my body. 
So he starts investigating. He goes to the doctor. They give the name. And they find out that this was from a man in Washington State. And the doctor contacts the family. And so finally this stunt man, this wicked man, wicked man, found the dad of, of, of this son whose heart was in his body. And he flies out there to see him face to face. And he encounters that man for the first time whose son gave his life to have his heart. The man's standing there face to face with the dad and he starts talking. He said, I want to thank you for your son and the life that you brought him up. I hear he was a good young man. He said, oh, he was an outstanding young man. He said, you know what? My son, I'm so proud of him because he loved the Lord. And he, he gave his heart to Jesus Christ. He said, that very heart that you have, I know it's a human heart, but that boy loved Jesus with that heart. And he said, I have one request before you leave. He said, what's that? He said, could I put my head on your chest and hear the heartbeat of my son? And that dad laid his head on his chest to that man. He said, listen, my day, when, when that dad expressed that love toward me about his, his heart's son, his son's heart rather, he, he said, something came over me like Bill, or his name was Jason. He said, Jason, you've been living a rough life. He said, it's about time that you do what that young man did and live out the rest of your life like that boy was going to. And he said, I gave my heart to Jesus. And he, he goes, listen, what a great testimony of a man. And I, every time I read about that disciple, John, who laid his head on the, on the chest of our Savior, I think about that man who has to lay his head on the chest of that man and hear the heartbeat of his son. You know, folks... The Word of God is so rich. I mean, we just covered four or five verses about Jesus praying and going to the mountain to pray and calling disciples. And I hope that somewhere between the message today and the message this evening has challenged you to be a greater disciple of our Savior. I mean, if, if, these, if these messages out of the Gospel of Mark doesn't challenge you to be a greater disciple... Then, then, my friend, I'm sorry. Your your heart is calloused. I mean, there's something that doesn't affect you. Something has to change. I want Bible Baptist Church to produce disciples of Jesus Christ. You know what we need to do? Go reach others. Go, I was looking yesterday. Uh, I don't think he's here tonight, uh, but I was uh, watching uh, Brian and Christine. Uh, Jonah. Uh, J Jonah came down here a few months ago, and Jonah got saved. I think the second time that he that he came. On, at 8.30 service, he walked down and got saved. And uh, I was watching Jonah yesterday. And uh, at the ladies' meeting, he was, uh, you know, Rebecca was barking orders, you know. And uh, now she, she told us to wear white shirts and black pants. He came in a white shirt and a black pant. And I saw him just running around the church. Him, Brother Linwood, was getting drinks and setting up stuff. And Brother Randy was here. Brother West was here. We had some folks up in uh, Hickory doing stuff. I mean, we had people everywhere yesterday. And uh, doing things. I saw Brother Joel outside. He was doing some stuff. And we just had people everywhere. And, but I saw Jonah. And Jonah's only been saved a couple months. You know what he's doing, though? He was, he was serving. You know what that is? That's, that's a form of discipleship. When we, we get people, but we, you know, he got baptized. And guess what we do? We say, Jonah, now attend church and read your Bible and pray. And do, 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 do what you read. O obey. Be obedient. And then we want you to put, put you in a place to serve. Here's what's sad is, There'll be people that's been saved for 10 years and they're still not doing. You got saved, okay, I'll never go to hell, thank the Lord. But that, there, there's way more than that. How about follow Christ? How about just oh, read this Bible and obey it? And just say, you know what, I'm going to do likewise. I'm going to tell the world about Jesus Christ. 